My message this morning is titled, Prodigal. And um, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word prodigal? Ah, the prodigal son, yes? Why didn't I call it the prodigal son? Because I knew that probably if I said prodigal, you would think of the prodigal son. But this message involves more than just the prodigal son. First, a definition. Um, you know what prodigal means? You all know what prodigal is? Some people don't really know, don't understand. They, they know that the prodigal son wasn't a very good son. Well, the definition, def, dictionary definition is characterized by profuse or wasteful expenditure. Wasteful. A prodigal person is a wasteful person, a la spends lavishly. Um, that's what we're calling the prodigal son when we call him prodigal. He's, he's wasteful. Now, I want to talk to you about a homecoming. How many of you have been away from home for a while? Yeah. Um, I know that um, if you've been away for a while, you know, your heart kind of aches for home. I remember when I was in the service, I was in basic training. And uh, basic training wasn't a lot of fun. You know, those of you who have gone through it can probably attest to that. Um, it was pretty stressful. And I wanted to go home more than anything. I wanted out of that military base just as quickly as I could get home back to, I was living with my mom at the time. I was still a pretty young guy. And I just, my heart just was at home. I, I, I never could find my place in the military. They did invite me to, you know, uh, sign up for many, many years. And I said, no, I don't think the military is just right for me. It's for, good for some people. You know, there's an old saying, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. And it's true, isn't it? I know when I'm away from my humble little home here in Sierra Vista and uh, Karen and I, you know, we take a trip maybe to Tucson and which I don't care. I don't like to go to Tucson anyway. It's traffic and heat. But I'm, you know, I'm on, when I turn on to Highway 90, I think I'm headed for home. And it feels so good to get off, first to get off of I-10, right? Oh boy, what a mess. And usually we're coming home about the time of rush hour on I-10. So it's even worse. But once you come on to 90, you can relax. I set that cruise control on 65. That's right, I do the speed limit. One lady there in Michigan we bought pianos from for the church, she said, I do the speed limit and the angels are with me. After I exceed the speed limit, I'm not so sure if they're still there with me. Our story begins in a father's house, as you know. There's a son that wants his freedom, so-called. You know, he, he's not a stranger or a heathen. I mean, he's been raised in, as from a child in his father's house. And he stands to inherit everything from his father. If he just stays there and, 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 and does his duty and uh, obeys his father, stays there, he inherits everything from his father. But, you know, he's not happy with that, so he asks his father, Father, give me my portion of the estate, and, and I'm going to leave. And the father, I guess he could have chained him down, but he didn't. He said, okay, here's your portion, and he went into a far country. You know, home, it was no longer good enough. There was something outside that drew him. His destination is physically, but also spiritually far away, isn't it? He believes that there's more fulfillment somewhere in the world outside his father's house. He's convinced of that. 
probably watched his buddies, you know, doing their thing out in the world and thought, you know, I could, I could do that. I could like, I'd enjoy doing that. So he begins to live it up. You know, the whole thing is a big party. And so here he is, the prodigal son in a tavern. Well, <laughs> the other title is the prodigal son in the brothel. And uh, the lady that you see him with there, this painting is, by the way, is by Rembrandt Van Rijn. Most people don't say his last name. It's Van Rijn. Uh, we know him just by Rembrandt. Uh, Rembrandt was uh, no doubt one of the greatest visual artists of all time and the greatest Dutch artist ever. Uh, he was born in what was then Holland, uh, now called the Netherlands, in 1606. A long time ago. But you see him here with this lady. By the way, the lady is his wife. Um, she's not a prostitute now. Don't misunderstand me. His wife acted as his model very often. And he himself is the prodigal son. He used himself as models, he, himself and his wife, Kaskia, as models for many of his paintings. She was way above his station in life. She fell in love with him, but she was a, a high-ranking patrician. And he was, you know, like a starving artist at the time, but she fell in love with him. They married they had three children who died in ch uh, soon after childbirth, which is sad. He had one other son after that who survived, but his wife died shortly after childbirth at 29 years of age. Very sad. So this young man takes his journey into this far country, and, and he soon realizes, though, that life outside his father's house isn't all it's cracked up to be. Things just don't go quite as he expected them to. And the Bible says that there arose a mighty famine in that land. That is the land where he is now uh, located. You might say the economy went belly up there. Times were hard. You know, the prodigal then, he says, man, what am I doing here? You know, when he had spent all of the money that his father had given him uh, on wine, women, and song, says there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. That can be dangerous right there. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, you need to know that Jews and pigs didn't get along. They were mortal enemies, pretty much. In fact, uh, well, a swine is not an edible animal, first of all. You know that. Swine are scavengers. They'll eat just about anything. Uh, and they, they're really pretty nasty animals. They're, they're very intelligent, by the way. Pigs are very intelligent animals. Um, but my mom raised in the deep south on a farm, and many of her relatives raised on farms. They used to raise pigs. And and you know, when the pigs would get ill, they'd get very sick, the veterinarian would come, and the first thing he would do was lift up the pig's paw or foot and clean out these little passages that empty out of the pig's foot. Anybody familiar with that? If you've been on a farm, you know anything about that? Because the poisons that the pig would eat would back up into his body and make him sick, and people would eat that. See, that's the problem. Pigs were never designed to be eaten. And Jews, of all people, they weren't even allowed to touch a pig, a dead pig, let alone eat it. So you know that when he's with these swine, feeding these swine, he's not really in a very good place. And he would fain, or be glad to, have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and maybe other slop that's there. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he finally came to himself. 
He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before thee, and am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Now his father never stopped waiting for him. That's important. I remember my dad very well. Uh, my dad was so good to me. And he was patient with me. He loved me so much. He, yeah, sometimes he, I would get punishment from him, but always in love. Uh, how many have good fathers? Good parents. What a wonderful thing. Good parents. A lot of people don't have good parents. So when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. So his father was looking for him, right? And, and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck. Well, that's figurative. He hugged him and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Or in modern terms, to party down. To have a good time. This painting is also by Rembrandt. And uh, I want to identify what's going on here. First of all, the, the character that you see kneeling there is the prodigal. Now, I hope you can see this pretty well. You know, the painting itself is very vivid, but the, when you reproduce it on computer, it doesn't really come out as well. This is the father, of course. That would be the elder son in the back. You see, notice his expression. Notice the elder son back there. By the way, uh, paintings and drawings and etchings of the prodigal son were very, very popular in the Baroque era, what was called the, the golden age of Dutch art, many artists painted uh, pictures and etchings and so on of the prodigal son, but none has the emotive power that Rembrandt's does. His work, his, this painting of the prodigal son, he did other etchings too of the prodigal son, a uh, very different looking scenario, but this one is what captured people's imagination and their mind. In the very background there, and you, I know you probably can't see the figure back there, but there is a woman back there in the back on the left hand side. And all of the commentators say it's probably the mother. Again, his wife Kaski opposed for that picture as well, for that painting. Now, notice the father's face. I highlight it there. Um, a benignant expression on his face, a, a loving look on his face, not a, not a look of uh, hatred or, or disgust or why did you do this? It's a look of love. And his father is regarding his sin no more. And I think of this scripture when I say that. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Isn't that good news? Do you want your sin remembered when you come before the Lord? He promises in this scripture that he will not remember your sin. Isn't that a good promise? 
Notice the word iniquity. Now, iniquity comes from a word that means uneven. Not even. Kind of out of shape. And when I worked as an editor, a technical editor, uh, one of the first things that happened was the boss came to me after I had done some editing on a, on a big piece of engineering work. And he said, well, Ray, did you use ragged right or did you use justified text? And I thought, what in the world is he talking about? I didn't know. I hadn't been an editor very long. Well, ragged right is like most of the th stuff that you type on your computer and the right hand side does that. Right? It's not evened up. And that's technically called ragged right. That's what we are. And our rags are unrighteous rags. We are ragged when we come to the Lord. But you can go to your computer and click in the, in the toolbar and you can justify the text. Justifying the text brings all of the lines over to the right and evens them up. So they're no longer ragged or uneven. And that's what Jesus does for us. He t and we have nothing to do with it. What did I say? We have nothing to do with it. Jesus justifies us freely. And we have not a single thing to do with it. We are brought over and evened up. We're no longer iniquitous. Good news. Here again is the, the painting. Love this painting. I, I've fallen in love with it. I've given this message a number of times. And, and I'm always amazed at the, at the, the thought that went into this uh, by Rembrandt. Um, notice, I'm going to outline the father and the prodigal son. By the way, I may go over a little bit today. I hope that doesn't bother anybody. I did some major revisions on this uh, presentation um, during the week and especially yesterday, and I hope it's not too awfully long. Notice that, that, notice that the, the central figure, even though they're not in the middle of the picture, who's in the middle of the picture, by the way? The, uh, the elder son, right? But notice who is most, even if I don't highlight it, notice how the light plays on them. On the father and the son. Do you see that? They stand out from that picture, even if I don't, you know, emphasize it by highlighting them with that circle. His father lightens up his life in a couple of ways. And I think of this from 1 Peter, where it says, But ye are a chosen generation, that's us, a royal priesthood, that's us, a holy nation. That's us, a peculiar people. Now, when, when the Bible says we're peculiar, it doesn't mean that we're weird. Although some of us might be. <laughs> peculiar, it doesn't mean, wow, he's really weird. It means he's different from other people in the world. We are to be different from people in the world. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. We know that. We've heard that a lot of times. So we're to be, well, peculiar is the word that's used, although I would think maybe unique. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you where? Out of darkness into what? His marvelous light. We have been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Isn't that good news? So let's go back. I want you to look at the elder back there. You notice uh, he's not lit up. You see that? That elder son is back there uh, in darkness. And Rembrandt did that for a reason. Rembrandt was apparently quite a spiritual man. The prodigal son and the father are in light. 
They're, they have been lightened by this situation. The elder son has been darkened by it. Isn't that interesting? And Rembrandt indicates that by putting the elder son there in the back. You can almost barely see him. He's back there kind of, you know, sulking and looking on. And notice too, notice the hands of the father on the, on the back of the prodigal son, blessing him. That's how we bless people. You know, when we uh, ordain somebody, for example, in the church, we come and we put our hands on them. Laying on of hands is a special thing, isn't it? It's a blessing to the person whose uh, body is being handled, if you will. And notice also the father's position there with the, the, the cape that he has on. Now, it's very common in those days to wear a tunic or a cape. But notice how it kind of envelops. It kind of overshadows the prodigal son as if it were sheltering him. That was deliberate on Rembrandt's part as well. Rembrandt might have been thinking of this scripture. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I know you've, you've read these many times. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And you would not. You wouldn't go for it. But now, if you're a father or a mother, you know that not all prodigals are sons. You don't have to volunteer any information. But I dare say, I'll bet that some of you have had prodigal daughters. It's not uncommon for children to be prodigal, wasteful, extravagant, you know, spending money their money and maybe your money on things they shouldn't spend it on. That's prodigal. The elder, you know, he's, he's kind of a Pharisee at heart. Remember, and we'll look at it again, he said, Father, I've obeyed all your commandments, done everything I was supposed to do. Isn't that kind of pharisaical? Thank God I'm not a sinner like my brother. Well, the elder, you know, he's furious. He doesn't like this situation at all. His elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf. Because he hath received him in health. In other words, he was in good shape when he came home. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and entreated him, begged him basically. And he answering said to his father, Lo, look, these many years do I serve thee. Neither have I at any time transgressed thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, a goat or calf if you like, that I might party down with my friends, make merry is the old fashioned expression. Yeah, you never did that for me. And here all the time I was so obedient and did everything I was supposed to do and served you and, and all that. You never did that for me. But as soon as this thy son had come, notice what he says. He doesn't say as soon as this my brother had come. What does he say? As soon as this thy son had come. Now he's not my brother. He's your son. Doesn't want to, uh, to avow any relationship to this prodigal son. Who hath devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is thine. It was meet or appropriate that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He was dead and now he's alive. He was lost 
and now he's found. How many of us have been dead, to, dead in sins and been made alive? How many of us have been lost and been found? I can identify with the prodigal. But I can identify with the elder son too. Are you surprised? Don't think too badly of me. But I have looked on people at points in my life and said, well, that no good louse, you know, what does he deserve uh, what he's going to get? You know, all these things that his family is going to give to him and all the blessings that he's going to receive. You ever felt that way? You don't have to answer. I think the, uh, the elder son needed to learn a lot about humility and, we and meekness. You know, in my previous uh, message, I talked about meekness. And, um, and I mentioned that meekness is not weakness. To be meek is to be teachable. To be willing to listen and to obey. God wants meek people, not weak people. What does he say about the meek? What do they inherit? Yeah. It's not the high and mighty that inherit the earth, is it? It's the teachable ones. God knows if we're teachable. God knows that if he takes us to heaven, we'll obey everything he says. If we're meek. If we're teachable. And that, to me, friends, is the primary requirement for getting into heaven. God knows if we'll follow him. Even if we're still making some mistakes on this earth, he knows that when we're saved, I'm not saying we're going to keep sinning and get into heaven, don't misunderstand me, but God knows that when we get into heaven, we're going to be anxious to do everything he says, if we're meek and teachable. Two men, you know this terrible, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, elder son, and the other a publican, tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican here. Does that sound kind of like the elder brother? I fast twice in the week. Look at all the eyes in this. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not even lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what God wants. God wants us to admit what we are and say, Lord, be merciful to me. Please have mercy on me. How dare we be anything else to the God of the universe? How dare we? I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be what? Abased, put down. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humility and meekness. So here's the elder again. And, and I, I must say, I, I consider him like a Pharisee at heart. I was once a Pharisee. I was once very judgmental and a bit self-righteous. I was. Still am to a certain extent. Now this man, can you see who I'm highlighting there? I know maybe it's kind of hard, but it's this guy right here. We don't really know who he is, but it's been speculated that he is maybe a financial advisor to the family. Um, he's observing what's going on, obviously. He sees the father blessing the prodigal son. And so he's observing what's going on. And I, I, he might be even a publican. In fact, some of the commentators on Rembrandt's paintings say that very likely a publican there. 
And that publican looking on to this situation where he sees this father loving and blessing this son that has been so, so bad, so prodigal. And I'm thinking maybe he thinks to himself, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Our story also begins in our father's house. We're not strangers or heathens any more than the prodigal son was. Many of us have been raised from childhood in our father's house. I was. I was an Adventist from the time I was an infant. Raised in the church. Ultimately, we stand to inherit everything that is our father's. If we, father, he's not going to hold anything back from us, is he? He didn't hold anything back from Jesus. Jesus, our representative. Now, I'm not saying God's going to give us everything all at once. I don't know if we could handle that. But God is willing to give us freely. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And he says that to us, too. You're ever with me. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But some are not happy in the Father's house. Some are not. Even, you know, a lot of apparently pretty devout people, not really happy in the Father's house. They want their freedom. I remember the, uh, the musician that they called Prince. You've heard of him, right? Guitarist and singer, rock and roll. I remember him saying in an interview, freedom is a wonderful thing. And he meant freedom to do anything you want. They had orgies, you know, he talked about. Freedom's a wonderful thing. They don't completely trust that God knows what's best for them. And that's, that's part of my problem too. My wife keeps telling me, Ray, honey, <laughs> look at the past. Look how God has come through for you. You've got to trust that he knows what's best, right? It's good to have a good wife. Blessed is the man that finds one. I feel very blessed to have my wife. They may not physically leave the church, but their heart is in a far country. Their heart is in a far country. And as we know, home is where the heart is. They're prodigal sons and daughters. Now, I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying that we have prodigal sons and daughters in our churches. We just do. It's part of, of this existence on earth. Part of the, 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 uh, the development process of people that are in the church. Hopefully they, they will work with God to not be prodigal anymore. Um, let God change their heart from a stony heart into a heart of flesh so that they will be the kind of meek and obedient people that God wants them to be. Many, if not most, Christians have been prodigal sons or daughters at some time in their lives. True? Yeah. So can we in some way identify with the prodigal son? I think so. Can we, it might be a stretch for you now, but can we somehow identify with the elder son, as I mentioned before? Any takers on that one? But they, that is we, may return and be reconciled with the father. Even Christ was tempted to be a prodigal son. Did you know that? How do I know that? Does the Bible say that Christ was a prodigal son? Or even tempted to be a prodigal son? 
Thank you. Thank you. What was that? Tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. If he was tempted in all points, then he was tempted to uh, go out on a binge. He was tempted to uh, lie. He was tempted to cheat. He was tempted to steal. He was tempted to be prodigal. Am I right or wrong? If we're tempted with those things, and the scripture says he was tempted in all things like we are, then he was tempted to be prodigal. But he wasn't. See, I, I try to use my logic in this, you know. And, but look what happened with Christ. He, he went a little further, it says, this is the Garden of Gethsemane, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let me get out of this. That's what he means when he says, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go on the cross. I don't want to die. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. That's the crucial idea, isn't it? Not my will, Lord, but yours. God never stops waiting either. Just like the, the father in the story, he never stops waiting for us. God will regard our sin no more. He's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. I didn't hear it. All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. But is this the end of our experience? Just being forgiven and so on? Do, do we stop at being a forgiven prodigal son or daughter? Is that the end of our experience? Well, no, Christ calls us to be perfect, doesn't he? Uh-oh. <laughs> There's that word. There's that word perfect. Okay, show me, Ray. All right, Matthew 5, 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Clear, right? But as Pastor Schnell once said, when you see the word therefore, you want to know what it's there for. Right? Because when you say therefore, that means something came before that. Let's look at what came before. You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, that is, be kind to them and so on, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans do that? But now wait a minute. That's Matthew 5, 43 through 47. What was this text up above that? That's Matthew 5, 48. Doesn't 48 come after 47? Unless I'm mistaken. I never was very good at math. But I believe that 48 comes after 47. So let's put it down where it belongs. So what this says is, Therefore, that is, because of this stuff up here, all this stuff, you know, up here, all this love and forgiveness and, and, and praying for your enemies and all that, if you do that, you will therefore be perfect. That's what the scripture's saying, guys. When we love as God loves, we are approaching God's perfection. The perfection that Christ calls us to is perfection in love. In love, my friends. Whether we identify with the elder brother or the prodigal, our ultimate goal is to be like the father. And God is love. What does that say? What is God? No, wait, maybe I didn't hear you right. What is God? It doesn't say God has love or God likes love or God endorses love. It says God is love. He, his very existence is love. So unconditional love is our goal. 
Here again is the prodigal son in the tavern. That was painted in 1635. He was about, oh, 29 years old at the time. Um, and this is a self-portrait painted in 1659. You can see, look at that carefully and then look at the picture of the prodigal son. <laughs> you can see he used himself as a model. See that? I don't know if you can tell. And then there's this one painted 10 years later, the return of the prodigal son, the one we've been talking about, 1669, and that's the year that Rembrandt died, the year that he painted this painting. Rembrandt, I think, recognized that home was more than a physical location, either here or in heaven. Home is a state of mind, a spiritual location, and a spiritual goal. God wants us to come home. We can and we must go home before we reach heaven. Now that seems like a, a, a contradiction, doesn't it? Heaven is our home, so we go home to heaven, right? But we have a work to do here first. We need to come home here before we go home to heaven. We need to come home here to the Lord before we go to heaven to the Lord. Does that make sense? It's not always easy coming home. By the way, I really appreciated uh, your harmonica solo there, Doug. That also spoke to my presentation today. Going home. We can begin to enjoy our inheritance before we even get to heaven. Did you know that? Here's our inheritance. It's a little bit lengthy, but let me read this to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. When? Before even the world was formed. That we should be holy and without blame before him in, in love. Having predestined us, that doesn't mean that certain people are predestined to be saved and others not. That's not what it means. It means that he has that destiny in, li in, in line for us if we accept it. That's what it means. Predestined. Unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Isn't it good to know that you're accepted in the beloved? In whom we have redemption through his Blood. See, it's Christ's blood by which we're saved. It's Christ's blood and his righteousness by which we're saved. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What is an earnest? What does the word earnest mean? What is earnest money? It's a down payment. That's what it is. We have an earnest of inheritance. He's given us a down payment of our inheritance. The full inheritance is yet to come, but we have a down payment here on earth. You realize that? Aren't you glad? Our homecoming, well, Christ is waiting for us to come home. He's always waiting. Am I saying that you're prodigal, that you're outside the home? No, I'm not saying that. But I don't know. Sometimes I feel like my, only my foot is in the door. My whole self is not in there yet. But are we ready?
to give up our home in a far country, so to speak, and come back to our Father's home. Are we ready for that? Our salvation is our homecoming. Not just going to heaven. Our salvation here on earth is our homecoming to God. But again, are we ready to give up our home in a far country, spiritually, and come back to our Father's home? You know, this famous old hymn says this. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. At the heart's portal, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Just come home. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to come home. We want to be enfolded in your arms and just be forgiven, be nurtured, be, be trained and taught by you. Lord, please make us meek, make us teachable. Bring us home, Heavenly Father. Create in our hearts the desire to be at home, the desire to be in you and you in us every moment of our lives. Please bless each person here today with that desire, Lord. A, a, a continuing desire to come home to you. And we thank you again for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.